You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Remember to subscribe to Event Horizon so you never miss an episode. Dr. Mirko Kurti, welcome to the program. Thank you very much. Now, Doctor, you've been working with the Hubble, or not the Hubble, but the rather the James Webb Space Telescope, our new wonderful instrument looking in the universe in infrared. And you're looking at the earliest galaxies, high redshift galaxies. Lay out for the audience exactly what that is. What what is a what about redshift tells you that these are the most distant galaxies? Well, actually, looking at the very high redshift galaxies, so the primeval galaxies, the primordial galaxies, the first galaxies that has been formed in the universe is one of the main goals of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, For redshift, we uh, refer to properties of galaxies for which the light which is emitted by these galaxies is shifted to the red part of the wavelength spectrum because of the cosmological expansion of the universe. So while the the, the light travels throughout the universe, the space itself uh, is expanding, and this stretches basically the the wavelength of the light as the light travels towards us, shifting its wavelength towards the red. So galaxies which, if, if if I observe a spectral features like, for instance, an emission line originating from the ionized gas in a very a local nearby galaxy, I would see that in the spectrum emitted at a, at the wavelength that I would expect from the atomic physics. Like, I, for instance, the Balmer lines, Balmer alpha line from hydrogen, I know it's emitted at 156 microns, more or less. But if I observed such a line in a very high redshift galaxies, this would be really, pretty much shifted at longer wavelengths. And these will be not anymore in the optical region of the spectra, but it will be shifted in the uh, near infrared. And that's why we needed the James Webb Space Telescope to observe lights from these galaxies at very high redshift because the very first galaxies, and when I mean the very, very first galaxies that have been now observed even from the JWST, I mean galaxies which are the cosmological redshift of uh, around 10 and even above. The light from these galaxies are shifted towards the reddest part of the spectrum and in particular to, into the uh, near infrared part of the spectrum and even, even, even above. So we need to go and again to the infrared. And there was the James Webb Space Telescope is the very first space telescope that can provide coverage of the near infrared and mid infrared wavelength regime with such high spatial resolution high sensitivity, and in particular is the first observatory in space that can provide spectra of many, many, many objects simultaneously. So what we call the multi-object spectroscopy. And this is what is done by the uh, NIRSPEC instrument of the JWST that we have been used in that work that we've published back in July and that we are currently using now with the, with the new data which is, uh, which is coming. So. Yeah, I don't know if this is clear or would you like to... Perfectly clear, crystal clear. Okay. So essentially, you could you could characterize it that previous telescopes like the Hubble simply couldn't see in this range and therefore could not see these galaxies. Exactly, because uh, James Webb, especially near spec, so can provide spectra of, galaxy with, of galaxies with uh, wavelength coverage uh, up to uh, 5.3 microns which means that we, uh, we are able to see the, for instance, the light emitted from the galaxy. For instance, I mentioned before the emission lines, one of the most bright emission lines from hydrogen, so the, the Palmer Alpha line, the so-called H-alpha. This is redshifted, for instance, at redshift, up to redshift 7.5 or something, is redshifted, but still visible from uh, near spec. And this was absolutely not possible before with any other any other instruments. Also because, of course, it's, it's always warranted to, to recall that those regions of the wavelength spectrum cannot be observed from, from Earth at all because 
the the Earth atmosphere is opaque to the near infrared radiation, so we need to go in space in order to do these observations. And yeah, this was absolutely not possible for before the advent of James Webb. And this is why James Webb will, but is already pushing a lot at the limits of the most high, ever, the most distant galaxies that we have ever observed. So there are already several reports in the in the literature from different groups of galaxy candidates, of candidates of galaxies observed up, up to redshift 10, 12, 13, 14, which still needs to be confirmed, but this gives an idea of, of the of the improvement that we that we are having with, with the, the James Webb compared to any other previous uh, facility. Now, by looking at these most distant galaxies, we're also looking back in time, close to the early universe, the, exactly. the birth of the universe. We're seeing the the very first galaxies. And from your paper, as I recall, you observed three galaxies, and one of them was an outlier. One of them was strange in that it was very low metallicity. It was made up in, almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. What exactly uh, is going on with this galaxy, ID 4590? Yes, so those three galaxies were part of the very first data that were released from the James Webb Space Telescope back in July. And they were observed in the framework of the so-called early release observations of the deep field that has been observed for targeting the one uh, um, galaxy cluster, which was as Max 0723. And uh, with the spectroscopy of, of NIRSPEC, and in particular with the, with the MSA, so the, the, the multi-object array of NIRSPEC, they have observed several galaxies which were in the background and that were uh, gravitationally lensed, lensed by the distribution of mass of, of the cluster in the foreground. So leveraging this gravitational lensing effect, which boosts the, the 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 sensitivity of because it, it basically uh, makes the galaxies that are uh, in the background look more uh, bright, like they are magnified. That is why it's actually called the gravitational lensing effect. It was possible to observe galaxies which were so faint and, and of so uh, low stellar mass that probably would have been possible otherwise. And what was interesting about the galaxies that we have focused on in our analysis is that we have focused on the three most, the galaxies at the, at the highest redshifts that were observed in, the, in that field, which were galaxies which were all at redshifts above 7.5. Two, uh, well, there were two galaxies at 7.5 and one galaxy at redshift 8.5, which means roughly 500 million after the, the, the 500 million years after the Big Bang. So these are very primordial galaxies. And the, the most interesting, for from our perspective, actually, was not of those of those early release observations were not the very beautiful images, of course, that were released, but the fact that in the spectra of these galaxies, we could clearly see the presence of very faint oxygen emission lines, which are key to infer the temperature of the gas, the temperature of the ionized gas of the ionized medium in these galaxies. And why do we care about measuring the gas temperature? Because the gas temperature and the metal content of the ionized medium are closely related to each other. Because metals, so um, uh, heavy elements, are the uh, acts as the primary cooling channel of the ionized interstellar medium, because they radiate away a lot of radiation, and so they cool, uh, they cool the, the the medium, okay, the interstellar medium. And so if we have a way basically to directly measure the temperature of the gas, we can put much more robust constraints on the metal content as well. But to give you an idea, to perform this kind of, uh, as we say, direct measurements of the temperatures, which exploit directly the, the measurements of, of, of spectral features, we need to detect and measure the flux of these very faint emission lines like, for instance, the lines of the oxygen-3, so this is a line, collisionally excited line for the double ionized oxygen, which is emitted at a rest frame wavelength of 4363 angstrom. And this line originates from a um, high en energy level with respect to other oxygen-3 lines, like the most bright line as 5007 angstrom. 
the ratio between the intensity of these two lines, since they are lines originating from the same atomic species, but coming from different energy levels, is uh, strongly dependent on the temperature. So the ratio between the intensity of these lines is a very good temperature uh, diagnostics. So if we can measure this ratio, we can constrain the temperature and we can also put much more robust constraints on the metallicity as well. The problem is that, is that these lines, which are called aurora lines, are really faint. And usually what I, what I mean by really faint, I mean that in the local, typically in the local universe, in local galaxies, which are relatively intermediate and high metallicity, these lines are as faint as 100th of their nebular counterparts. So if I measure uh, the, the intensity of the oxygen 3 line at 5007, which is 100, the intensity of this auroral line at 4363 would be something of around 1. Okay, so these are really, really faint lines that are really, really challenging to detect even the most nearby galaxies. So it, was, so it was absolutely stunning for us to see that in all of the three galaxies that were targeted by the James Webb in these very first observations, we did see clearly the presence of these lines in all of the three spectra. And we could clearly detect emission line fluxes for, for, for these three galaxies. These were the absolutely, by far, the very first observations of these key aurora lines at such, at such high redshift. And the very first time that we could apply this so-called direct temperature method for measuring the metallicity in this galaxy. So this was already by itself gives an idea of, of the improvement of the giant leap that James Webb has brought in, in, uh, in this specific field, right, for, for assessing the, the properties of the ASM and the, and the metallicity of the ASM in particular of very high redshift galaxies. So leveraging on the intensity of these very faint auroral lines that we have measured in these galaxy spectra, we have derived robust metallicities for these galaxies. And what we found is that, okay, of course, these are really primordial galaxies. So it is expected that these galaxies are less enriched with respect to their local counterparts. Of course, of, of the of local galaxies that we see in the, in the, in the nearby universe, because we already know that we, we, we found in the past evidence for an evolution in the chemical properties of galaxies with redshift, such that galaxies of the same stellar mass are less enriched at high redshift with respect to galaxies in the local universe. So this is expected that the galaxies at very high redshift are less enriched than galaxies in the local universe at the same, uh, for the same uh, galaxy stellar mass. The point is that two of these three galaxies were reasonably in agreement with what have been expected given their mass and given their redshift. One of these, which was what you have called the, uh, what it was uh, called the ID 4590, instead looked much more metal poor even than, than expectations, because we have inferred a metallicity which were just roughly 4% solar metallicity or something like that. So. The fact, what, what was interesting is that this galaxy was actually among one of one I think of the most metal poor objects which have has ever been observed in the universe, comparable to some of the most metal poor objects that we see in the local universe, which are generally very small, so-called dwarf galaxies, which indeed has been for a long time consider potential analogs of very high redshift sources. But now, again, uh, we, 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 we can actually observe these very high redshift sources directly. We don't have to rely on local analogs anymore. And this galaxy resembled, not only in terms of, this galaxy at redshift 8.5 resembled, not only in terms of the metallicity, but also in terms of, the, of its um, uh, properties of the ionizing medium, the properties that we see in uh, nearby uh, extreme extreme um, metal poor dwarfs in the local universe. So then said that, what is, what is also puzzling about this galaxy is that, as I said, we do expect in principle that galaxies at high redshift has uh, had less time, of course, to, to form their metals. So they're less enriched than the galaxies in the local universe. 
But if we can, I would say, explain and, and model the evolution of the metal content of galaxies as a function of their stellar mass and as a function of redshift, we could somehow predict right, what, what the metal listing would be for a given galaxy on average at a given stellar mass and at a given redshift, so at a given cosmic time. This galaxy was pretty far off any of these kind of predictions. Of course, these predictions have, has never been tested at such high redshift. They have been tested only, uh, observationally speaking, only at redshift uh, up to redshift 3, which were the, 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 the top redshift for which we could detect the, the key emission lines for for measuring the metallicity in, in high redshift galaxies. So JWST is basically allowing us to do a jump between redshift 3 and redshift 9, 10, and even above, and so constraining the metal, the, 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 the evolution of the metal enrichment in galaxies throughout basically the entire history of the universe. So when tested, the prediction of the for the metallicity of galaxies given the, the mass and given the, the redshift, this galaxy redshift 8.5 in particular was deviating completely from, from, from the predictions. And since the what we expect is that this galaxy, on average, well, galaxies which are in a sort of an equilibrium state between their star formation activity, so how, ma how many stars they form, how many gas, how much gas they accrete from the cosmic web, and how many metals they produce. So if these kind of processes are in equilibrium, we can somehow predict the metal content of galaxy of, of a given galaxy known its stellar mass, uh, its star formation rate, and its redshift. But if galaxies are completely off from this equilibrium state, of course this model will not work anymore. And what the uh, metallicity of this high redshift 8.7, ga 8.5 galaxies suggests it has, is that this galaxy was off from the equilibrium between gas accretion, star formation, and metal production, which is in place at later epochs, and so that we can use to predict the, the, the metal content of galaxies throughout the, the, the cosmic time. Does this galaxy give us an opportunity, perhaps, to say that we may be seeing the fabled population three stars? <laughs> Unfortunately not, because you, um, one should recall that for population three stars, which, or in this case, population three galaxies, I would say, so there are galaxies which are dominated by ionizing radiation coming from population three stars, should actually not, should, shouldn't show any evidence for beta lines features at all in their spectra. Okay, so even if these are very metal poor galaxies, the ones that we have been analyzing, these clearly show the presence of metal lines. So we, we see clearly the many oxygen lines, for instance, but also we have seen neon lines and, and others. So this galaxy certainly has some metals which have been already produced by previous generation of stars and this has been already released into the interstellar medium. So then the interstellar medium is then being ionized by a subsequent generation of stars and emitted in the in the in the, the lines in the of different uh, heavy element species. The search of, for pure population three stars and population three galaxies is of course one of the main, I would say, scientific goals of JWST. But that would be very challenging for JWST too. So there has been different studies that have investigated the possibilities of JWST to detect actually signature of population three stars. But of course, we don't even know exactly what the clear spectral signature of a population three stars dominated galaxy would be because we have never seen one. Okay, so in this sense, there's a lot of theoretical works that has been done to try to calibrate potential spectral diagnostics that can be used to discriminate between pure population three stars and other population of stars. In, in this sense, one key observational feature, apart from the fact that in a spectrum of purely population three stars or population three galaxies, you shouldn't see any metal line, but one key feature that you should see that should be very prominent in case a galaxy spectrum is dominated by the population three stars 
would be the presence of helium-2 lines. And why, is it, why helium-2 lines? Because uh, the ionization potential, uh, helium-2 lines comes from fully ionized uh, helium. Okay, and the, uh, the ionization potential of helium is really large is around 54 electron volts. To compare the ionization potential of hydrogen is 13.6 electron volts. So in order to produce ionized helium, you do really need a very hard ionizing continuum. So the light should be energetic enough, I would say, <laughs> to, to be able to ionize the helium. And so when the helium recombines, it produces emission lines that we can see in the spectra. So if we do see, if we, if we could see spectral galaxies in which we do see clear, uh, the clear presence of helium-2 features, helium-2 lines, which are very strong, and in particular, which are very strong compared to the underlying stellar continuum, that would be one of the key evidence for the presence of, of population three stars, because population three stars are thought to be very, very massive stars, which have formed from primordial clouds of, of, of molecular hydrogen. And current theoretical expectation described that population three stars should be actually, uh, well, population three, yes, stars should be actually very massive. And so they should produce, and since they are, are very massive and also metal free, because they are produced by basically purely pristine gas, their ionizing continuum should be very, 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 hard, as we say in, in, in astronomy. So this should be capable of ionizing helium and produce very strong emission lines of helium, and in particular helium-2 lines. So the presence of helium-2 lines, and in particular the relative strength of the helium-2 lines with respect to other spectral features, could be one of the key things to look at to identify galaxies which are dominated by population, population three stars at very high redshift from, from JWST uh, observations. Absolutely amazing. Now, give us a sense with ID4590, how many light years away is this? I mean, how much, how far back in time are we looking? How soon after the Big Bang is this uh, this galaxy? So, uh, redshift, so this is redshift um, 8.5, which is roughly 500 million years after the Big Bang. So these are really one of the most distant galaxy ever observed for which we have spectra, okay? Now, as I said, there has been already in the first weeks and months of observations of JWST, different research groups which have suggested that some galaxies have been observed even at higher redshifts, okay? This still has to be confirmed. And so there's a lot of work going on in during these weeks as well to confirm spectroscopically, so from the spectra, the redshift of these galaxies, which are galaxies which are potentially supposed to be a redshift higher than even 12 or 13. This would be the, the, the highest redshift galaxies ever observed to date. But this was, at the time the data came out, the, the highest redshift galaxies in which we could do this kind of study with, with such detail. That's, that's for sure. There have been scientists in the past that have asked the question, do we have actually have a good idea of a good understanding of redshift and that maybe redshift is misleading? It does this primitive galaxy and, and the state that it's in, the low metallicity state, finally lay that to bed? Any questions on the validity of redshift? Yeah, so what, what do you mean by the validity of redshift? Because, I mean, redshift is kind of a pretty clearly understood physical property of gas. So, of course, uh, in, in, since in order to convert, I would say, redshift as measured from the spectra, because redshift is clearly measured from the spectra. Okay, you, you do expect, a clear, for instance, you do expect an emission line feature at a given wavelength, which is a, a, the wavelength at which the, that specific emission line, for instance, is emitted. And you see that at much redder wavelengths. Okay, so this is pretty much shifted towards the red part of the spectrum. So. Redshift from, from galaxy spectra, when you do detect clear emission lines that you can identify, is easy to calculate. Then, to convert redshift to a given physical, for instance, age of the universe, then you need a cosmological model. Okay, so what, what is done usually now that we assume the standard so-called lambda, called dark matter, 
cosmological model and we can convert a given redshift to a given age of the universe, okay? Then, of course, it's, it's, it could be that forthcoming observations of J, with JWST could kind of cast doubts on the validity of the lambda CDM, of the lambda cold dark matter cosmological models, and, and might, might uh, prompt for, for some revisions of it. But redshift is quite a um, kind of uh, a robust observational uh, signature, say, that, that can be derived from, from the spectra. So I don't know what, 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 what you exactly meant by validity of redshift. Well, there's just been in the past, probably the distant past by now, there was, there's mm -hmm. been some that said, well, maybe redshift is thrown off by certain spectral features of galaxies. Maybe they're reddened or things like, you know, things like that. But it seems to me that if you look, if you look at a very early galaxy like this and you see it in a state where it's mostly just hydrogen and helium, then that sort of validates our ideas about redshift. We understand it correctly. Yeah, yeah. So no, maybe you're referring to the fact that redshift a high redshift can sometimes be misinterpreted and, and well, we, we could sometimes misinterpret a given observation of a galaxy for a high redshift, whereas instead is a, for instance, quietly dusty obscured galaxy. Some, you mean something like that? Because the, that yeah, something a, like that. Yeah. Okay, that would, but this, okay, okay, well, now I understand. So this is, this is a different story. Okay, so what, what I've been talking about are galaxies which, for which we can clearly and robustly confirm the redshift from spectroscopical information. Because from the spectra, you, as I again uh, repeat myself, you do see one or more, hopefully more, right, emission line features that you would expect at a given wavelength, rest frame wavelength, as you say, then you observe them as a redshifted wavelength and you can precisely calculate the redshift. So in, it, we, we, when you do have spectroscopic confirmation of redshift, you're pretty sure that what you're measuring is right, is correct. Of course, you do not always have spectroscopy, at least at the beginning. Sometimes you only have to rely on imaging. Okay, so you do have images of galaxy fields in different filters, in different bands. And of course, you can model the distribution of, of, of the light that you see in the different filters a different fields that's going to respond to different wavelengths, but not like spectra. Right? The, the filter uh, of, of different imaging instruments are can be quite broad, so they encompass a large fraction of, of, of wavelength. It's not just like spectra that I have the information at each given wavelength. Okay, so sometimes it can be that a galaxy that would appear red and maybe some model interpreted as a high redshift galaxy instead is a, for instance, a dusty galaxy because one of the effects of dust is to absorb the, absorb the light in the blue and re-emit it in the red. So sometimes one can misinterpret observations of a red galaxy, I would say, as a high redshift galaxy when instead was a dusty galaxy at lower redshifts. But then what we usually do in the story when we have candidates of high redshift galaxies selected through the photometry, so through the imaging only, then we do what we call spectroscopic follow-ups. So we observe with the spectroscopy this galaxy to be able to confirm the redshift from emission lines uh, features in the spectra. And when we have the confirmation from emission lines features in the spectra, we're pretty much, uh, meaning we're pretty much sure that the redshift is correctly uh, determined. Now, what's next in this research? So... You see the the difference between ID 4590 and the other galaxies that you looked at. Are you going to go back and use more of JWST's measurements yeah. to see if you find other examples of this type of thing, this metal pore? Definitely, definitely. I, I would say that those galaxies, of those three galaxies and those early release observations were really, really the tip of the iceberg. Okay, so uh, now there are already a lot of observational programs, both in imaging and in spectroscopy, which have been carried out during summer or are currently carried out while, while we're speaking, okay? And we are actually working on one of, one of these, le leveraging imaging and spectroscopic observations, quite deep imaging and spectroscopic observations of a very high redshift galaxies. And I, I cannot tell you anything about this, unfortunately, because this is analysis which is still ongoing, so I 
I'm, I'm, I'm not allowed to, to talk that much about that, but the idea is actually that, is that we will find many more uh, galaxies, we, we will have many more galaxies at, at such high redshifts and even higher than the ID4590, uh, for which we can measure the metallicity in the same way that we did for that galaxy in particular. So we will have more galaxies and we, we well, by having more galaxies, we could definitely much better constrain if, if, and if there is and how much there is an evolution in the chemical enrichment of galaxies at, at, at the very high redshift, which is something that is, was not, of course, possible with, only, with, with observations of only three galaxies. Okay, so three galaxies were just to demonstrate that this kind of science is now possible. And then it's become possible, suddenly became possible with the advent of GWC. It was absolutely not possible before. So these were kind of a sort of a perfect flagship of the capability of GWC. But then in terms of how much we can uh, much better constrain and um, from even from a more uh, robust statistical perspective, the chemical evolution of galaxies at high redshift will be something that will... Uh, we will come with the uh, with, uh, forthcoming and, and current observations which are going on, which will be analyzed and, and released then in the, the next few weeks and, and months. So this is actually what we are doing and what we will be doing for the next couple of years, at least. And then, I mean, we know that the James Webb Space Telescope, hopefully, is a mission which, were, which was um, originally planned to last at least five years, but now the most optimistic expectations is that it could last at least 10 years. So there certainly will be much, much more data to be work, to, to, to work on in the, in, the, in the next few years. So we are really entering, I would say, a golden age, a golden era for studying the, the galaxy evolution properties at a very high redshift. The glorious science of the James Webb Space Telescope is coming in. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor, for uh, appearing with us today, and I hope you come back. Thank you very much for uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and hope to chat with you again soon with new exciting results from the GWST. Absolutely. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. What a really great interview. Hey Aaron, have you ever, uh, you ever wondered if alternate universes exist? Um, no, not really. You can't ever prove it, so does it matter? Yeah, probably not, I know, but I just can't shake the feeling that there might be more to this. Like, I might be in the wrong reality, or the right one. Well, you could have fooled me. I think it's time I collect my checks so I can hit the road. Wait a minute. It was an alternate reality. The possum has gained control over the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yes, John. And it seems one of my iterations actually gets paid. Yeah, none of mine do. <laughs>